Hi there, it's us here. I've taken the IELTS exam four times, and every time I achieved band 9 in IELTS listening. Even when my overall score was 7.5, I still got a 9. Actually, it was 7.5 because the listening score pulled up my overall score. And in this video, I want to share with you all my strategies for both the paper-based and computer-based versions of the exam. I want to talk about the most difficult types of tasks and just share some tips you should know. Okay, let's get started! Before we talk about the strategies, let me quickly tell you about the exam format. First of all, IELTS listening is absolutely the same in IELTS academic and general training. It includes four sections and lasts for 30 minutes. You need to answer 40 questions. Questions at the beginning are easier than questions at the end. But I personally find section number three the most challenging, even more challenging than section number four. Of course, it may be different for you. How are your scores calculated? Each correct answer is worth one point, and you don't lose any points for incorrect answers. And actually, I found a more detailed table with scores than uh, what you usually see. Here it is. If you answer between 23 and 25 questions correctly, you get a 6. If you answer 30 or 31 questions, you get a 7. 35 and 36 will bring you an 8. And actually, if you answer one question incorrectly, you still get the top score. And if you answer two or three incorrectly, you get 8.5. If you take a paper-based exam, you'll be marking your answers on the question sheets and then you have 10 minutes at the end to transfer and check your answers. That's plenty of time. But if you take a computer-based exam, you select your answers on the screen and they are already in the system. So you're only given two minutes to check your answers at the end. In the past, before the real exam started, you were given a short um, demonstration task, but from 2020 it was removed. And if you take some old practice tests, it's still going to be there. Keep it in mind, during the real exam you will hear instructions and then the recording starts straight away. Okay, now let's talk about the strategies. I think you understand well that how many questions you can answer correctly depends on how many words you know and uh, how well you can understand the recordings. That's clear. But even people who understand everything that has been said are not guaranteed to answer all the questions correctly. And that's because IELTS listening is pretty intense and it seems like you're expected to listen and read and write all at the same time. And that's really challenging. Once you miss something, like that's it, it's gone, it will never be repeated. But I think the solution lies in managing your time and knowing exactly when to listen and when to read then you don't have to do both at the same time. Here is what I do. Uh, once the test starts, you are free to move between pages, between sections as you wish. You don't have to listen to the command to move to the next set of questions. As soon as it starts, I quickly look at the type of the task and I just start reading and memorizing questions as many as I can, like everything from the first section. And then once, then I start answering questions. And as soon as I've answered the last question of the first section, I stop listening because in the recording there will be usually what one last sentence that doesn't give you any new information you need, then they will tell you now you have some time to review your answers and you get some time. And then they say, oh, now you have some time to read questions from the next section. So I dedicate all this time 
to reading questions from the next section. And then I'm able to read them all, to highlight keywords, to try to memorize options, and then when the recording starts, I know my questions much better, so it's easier for me to select the correct information from the recording I hear. If you simply rely on the instructions and you listen to the command, uh, read questions from the next section, you will not be able to read them all. I tried, I read pretty fast in English now, but there is no way I can do it, particularly in section number three, where you get those multiple choice questions, where the question itself is quite long, and then you have usually six options, which are also quite long, and you need to choose two correct options. So if you haven't read all of that, you won't be able to find them. Uh, of course, in order to understand what time you can dedicate to reading, you need to know the exam format very well. So you need to take several practice IELTS listening tests, take the official tests, several of them are available for free and um, I've linked all of them in my IELTS study plan in the description. So take those tests and just try to find all the time you can to read questions. And as I read them, I highlight keywords. Uh, that will help me to find the correct options during the test. And I, in the paper-based exam, I also cross out incorrect options straight away. If I hear something and I see that this option is incorrect, I just cross it out straight away. Because later, for example, if I miss the correct answer, but I've crossed out two incorrect options, then I have a 50% chance to guess correctly, right? Uh, of course, in a computer-based exam, you can't cross out anything. You can highlight keywords, but um, in order to do that, you need to select the word, click the right button on your mouse, and then select highlight. It takes a bit too much time. And uh, in a computer-based exam, I actually don't highlight anything. I just try to find and memorize keywords and different options. So from this point of view, taking a paper-based exam is a little bit easier. What should you do after the recording stops? In the 10 minutes during the paper-based exam and two minutes given during the computer-based exam. Well, of course, in a paper-based exam, you transfer your answers to the answer sheet. You're given a lot of time for that. You should also review all the questions you missed. But that's the time to do that. And even if you missed it during the recording, try to read it again and decide what the answer is based on what you remember. Sometimes it's possible to do that. If you don't remember anything, just take your best guess, mark any answer. And in a computer-based exam, you can actually mark sections to review. You simply click a box to review. And then after the test, you can see which questions you should go back to. In a paper-based exam, you simply put question marks. It's not a problem. You should also review the spelling of all the words you wrote down in full just to make sure it's correct because if the spelling is incorrect, it's an incorrect answer, simple as that. And uh, I don't think it's worth checking other answers in a computer-based exam because you simply don't have time for that. In a paper-based exam, there is one more thing to keep in mind the correct answer format. Sometimes you're given a number of options, A, B, C, D, and each stands for one word, for example, school, field, park, something else. And you must answer the correct letter B, and if you write down field, it's an incorrect answer. Be careful about that. It's not a problem in a computer-based exam because you simply click on the correct option. Now I want to tell you about four sections of the IELTS listening exam. Why do you need to know that? Well, because each section comes with its own types of questions. 
And if you know what those are, it's easier for you to anticipate what's coming and it's easier to navigate your way through the listening section. Okay, uh, IELTS listening includes four sections. Number one, it's a dialogue. On a general topic, uh, for example, someone calls to inquire about a job opportunity or someone calls an estate agent to inquire about different flats they have for rent. Or someone wants to join a club and wants to know more about their activities. And usually you are given notes and you need to fill in missing words. In the past, section 1 always included a task where you need to write down either a word that is spelled out, for example, a surname or a street name, and those would never be spelled the way you expect or a number, a telephone number or a flat number. And the flat number would be something like 21B and uh, you don't normally expect the flat number to include a letter as well, right? So there is always like a bit of a trick in this task. But actually when I took the test in 2020, I didn't have this question. Now, section number two. That's a monologue. One person is talking and you learn about um, a tour you can take around the town. Or, for example, you join a company and you hear more about the company. Or you hear about how you should use the library. And that's where you may get a map. Those are tricky <laughs> and uh, I actually have a practice task if you want to know more about them. Instead of a map, you may get a matching exercise. For example, you hear about a company and you're given a list of surnames of its employees and a list of responsibilities and you need to match employees with their responsibilities. In both types of tasks, the difficulty is that you have very little time to find the answer before you, can, you have to move on to the next one. Section number three, that's again a dialogue. Usually two people are talking in a more academic environment. For example, two students are discussing their university project. And that's where you get multiple choice questions. So you get a question and for example, four options, you need to choose one that is correct or six options and you need to choose two which are correct. The difficulty is that you have a lot to read. That's where you have to do most of your reading, section number three. And that's why you need to find time in order to be able to do that. Section number four uh, is also academic, but it's a monologue. Usually it's a university lecture. And here, uh, you need to know more words in order to be able to understand everything. But I actually find that you have a bit more time for each answer than in sections number two or three. So it's not that bad. Now let's talk about some of the more difficult types of tasks. The first type of task is missing words. It may be presented in a number of different ways. Sometimes you get notes. And some words are missing. Sometimes you get a flowchart or a table. Whatever it is, you always see those gaps. And sometimes you need to write down words yourself. You may read, write down no more than one word or a number. Or not more than two words or a number. Then your answer may consist of one or two words. And you should anticipate what kind of word you're looking for. Is it going to be a noun or a verb? What kind of meaning it should have? For instance, you have this sentence. The number of whales mm -hmm, in recent years. What are we looking for? A verb, right? What kind of verb? Something that would describe the change in numbers. Perhaps it either increased or decreased and then if you know that it's easier for you to find the answer. 
uh, remember that when you write down the word, the sentence should become grammatically correct. And that can help you decide whether your noun should be singular or plural and what form of the verb you should use. Spelling matters. All your answers should be spelled correctly. And you can write down all your answers in capital letters. That's a good thing to do if your handwriting is a bit difficult. Uh, you can use it in both computer-based and paper-based exams. Uh, but if you don't use all capital letters, then if you get someone's surname or a name of a street, you have to capitalize the first letter. The next type of task is multiple choice questions. That's where you get a question and four options with one correct answer or six options with two correct answers. In the last two exams I took, I got six options with two answers. This one is more difficult because you have more to read, more options. And then when you hear the dialogue, they will discuss all the options and what matters is what they say about each of them. So if you take a paper-based exam, when you're reading those questions, highlight keywords, then you can quickly find which option they are discussing. And then you listen to what they say. And if it's not the correct answer, you hear it's not the correct answer. Cross it out straight away because they will not come back to this option. And it seemed to me that answers tend to lie in the middle of each discussion. I mean, the first option they mention is usually not the correct one. And the last one is not correct either, because in IELTS, they tend to give you a little bit of time to mark your answer before moving on to the next question. But of course, the order is not guaranteed, but you should try to memorize keywords and listen to each option. The next type of question is maps. It's used in the second section of the listening test. So there will be one speaker talking about everything on the map. And usually questions come in order. Uh, so you're given a number of questions, let's say from number 10 to number 15. And each question mm, stands for an object. And then on the map, some locations are marked, like A, B, C, D, and you need to find where each object is located. So usually they will talk about object number 10 first, then number 11, number 12, and so on. So it's a little bit easier. Particularly if you miss one answer, it doesn't have to mean that you miss all others because they will mention the next object and then they will tell you where you should go. For maps, you should always find the starting point, usually that's the entrance, or it's at the bottom of the map. And you should also learn compass directions. When they say go to the south or northwest, you should understand what it means. I have a practice task for maps, I will link it in the description. Now let's talk about the differences between IELTS listening, computer-based and paper-based. Well, first of all, in a computer-based exam, you always get your earphones, which means you can hear everything really well. I remember when I was not very confident, I always increased the sound a lot and it made the difference. In a paper-based exam, it seems like more and more centers use earphones too, but not all of them. When I took my paper-based exam in London, I was in a huge room with dozens of people and speakers, and I couldn't hear it well at all. Next, in a paper-based exam, you need to transfer your answers to the answer sheet, and you get 10 minutes for that. That's very generous. It means you have quite a lot of time to check your answers, to think about answers you missed. In a computer-based exam, you only get two minutes. So you can review a few questions, but not many.
in a paper-based exam, you actually have to think about the correct format for your answer, that whether you need to write down a word or a letter. In a computer-based exam, you don't have to think about that. But you have to be quite a confident computer user, because sometimes you just click on the correct answer, it's easy. Sometimes you need to type words while listening, or drag the correct option to the correct place. And imagine if you put it on the wrong place, you need to undo it while still listening. And of course, if you want to take uh, the computer-based exam, you must practice and learn the interface before you take it. Because the first time, first I almost missed one of the questions altogether because I didn't scroll down the page. And then I expected that um, the page would turn to section two itself and it didn't because I needed to click to do that. But now you can take the full computer-based practice test on the IDP website and it's exactly like the real exam. It's linked in my IELTS study plan. In a paper-based exam, you don't have to think about dragging things and so on. You just use your pencil. Uh, you can cross out incorrect answers very quickly. You can underline keywords. In a computer-based exam, you do have a function to highlight words, but each highlighting requires a few clicks and it's just too much time and effort, so I don't do that at all. And I find that crossing out incorrect answers is really, really handy. So think which format is better for you. Perhaps you've noticed that so far I've been talking about strategies for IELTS listening, but of course your success rate depends on how well you can understand the recording on the first place. And I actually have a separate video where I talk about different techniques that help you develop your IELTS listening skills. It's gonna be right on the screen and all the links to preparation materials are in my IELTS study plan. Thank you for watching me today. Good luck with your preparation and your exam. Bye!